we're here at the Denver Supercomputing right here. And uh, who are you? Uh, my name is Wu Feng. Uh, I'm a professor uh, of computer science and electrical and computer engineering at Virginia Tech. Uh, I also am the founder of uh, the Green 500, which maintains uh, a list of the most energy efficient supercomputers in the world. So uh, a supercomputer, you don't want to just use a lot of power. That's, that's not very efficient, right? It's expensive. Or it's expensive. It so I, I think um, uh, we as a community are starting to realize that we don't want to build the Formula One race car of supercomputers. If you think about a Formula One race car, it requires a lot of maintenance, right? You have pit crews that change the tires, that maintain the running of the system. And so the idea is, um, can we back off of that a little bit, still be high performance, but then also be able to do uh, highly efficient uh, uh, computing. So think of, instead of a Formula One race car of, of supercomputing, you do a, a, a Nissan 370Z of supercomputing. So something that is very fast, but reliable, doesn't require a pit crew necessarily to maintain, right? You don't have to take it to the shop or fuel it up often. It gets good gas mileage, it's very fast. Toyota so, Prius. A Toyota, well, maybe a, a souped up Toyota Prius. So, so, up. So, so, so like a Toyota Prius is kind of like at the other extreme. One wouldn't consider that as a high performance machine, right? That would be a very uh, highly energy efficient. Maybe a better example might be uh, you know, a Tesla, a, a, a Tesla S or a Tesla 3 or whatever that car. That's energy efficient. It's also very fast, high performance. Think of, uh, I think you might be old enough to know this, uh, remember this uh, movie. Do you remember, uh, there's a movie called Cannonball Run yeah. with Burt Reynolds. I don't know if you remember that movie. Maybe. So basically it's yeah. a race across the United States. I forget if it was Los Angeles to New York or New York to Los Angeles. And so the people, uh, the fastest car that they're going to be, they take, is they don't buy a Formula One race car. Yeah. They're not looking at a Formula One race car. What they're trying to do is they're maybe getting a, a Lamborghini or they're getting a Camaro. They're getting some fast car that's reliable, that gets reasonably good gas mileage so that they're not always fueling up or they're not always in the shop having to repair something in the car. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, and so it's a race to get from uh, one side of the continent to the other, and it's all about miles driven in the short amount of time. So relative to supercomputing, it's like, I'm more concerned about the answers per month than I am about the floating point operations per second. Answers per month. Uh, so is the only way to do supercomputing in the future is to be very power efficient? Is that going to be the only way to physically make it happen? Because you need to use you need to be able to fit a certain space. You need to be able to not use too much power. If you, and if you just don't care about that, then uh, you're not going to be able to do it, actually, or something. Well, I think it's more more one of uh, it's it's a that's true to a certain degree. Um, it's more fiscal uh, a fiscal challenge. Uh, and what I mean by that, it's high price to the too, scale. Yeah, the price could be too high. So, like, if you if you have a if you have a 50 megawatt system the amount of money that it's going to cost in terms of powering and cooling that system is, it, it, it is going to be very expensive uh, relative to the, the cost of the supercomputer. So um, the general rule of thumb, it's just a rule of thumb, it's like for every megawatt of uh, power consumption, you need roughly a million do US dollars uh, to power and cool it. Well, if you have a 50 million, if you have a 50 megawatt system, well, that's 50 million dollars that you're spending Do you have that? annually. And, Do you have that? You know, I, I, if I had that, you know, I, 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 I wouldn't be here. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, you, wouldn't be, you wouldn't be a professor anymore. Yeah, yeah there you I'm go. Just okay. So, um, so, uh, so there are uh, there are some constraints, and so right now what we're doing is part of the Green 500, uh, which which we've which has been integrated with uh, the Top 500 now. What the Green 500 is trying to look at is, can we get to an exascale in a 20 megawatt uh, thermal power? And in order to do that, that means machines have to be able to sustain 50 gigaflops per watt. And right now, uh, you'll hear this uh, officially uh, on Wednesday, and you'll get to hear from the 
uh, people that are in the number one in the green 500 uh, slot, uh, they've managed to reach uh, over 16 gigaflops per watt. Who's number one? Uh, it's a supercomputer called Shobu. Uh, it's at uh, Riken, R-I-K-E-N. So um, it's, a, it's a Japanese? It's a Japanese... Uh, is it using ARM chips? Because we're standing right here with the ARM stuff. ARM is trying to be... To, ARM is trying to claim that they're very uh, power efficient, right? Um, yeah, so in general, ARM is a very efficient uh, architecture. The, the Isambard one, though, my understanding is, is that uh, with Simon McIntosh-Smith, that one is is a traditional ARM processor. It's not. It's not going to have particularly efficient uh, um, processing cores. It's, it's going to be a typical kind of an Intel AMD type of uh, processor. It's going to be targeted at the server space. But ARM, of course, has a whole line of, of processors from uh, you know in the embedded and low power space that certainly can be used. In fact, uh, I think. Um, uh, I was just saying, Barcelona Supercomputing Center has, uh, it looks like they're going to pair uh, an ARM chip with um, uh, NVIDIA Volta GPU for, for their upgrade uh, for the supercomputer. And I think, in fact, they're right, they're right over there, the, uh, in, in that booth over there. So, so. Uh, do you specialize in parallel computing? And everybody's been talking about that forever. And, uh, and that's a very important thing to be able to master when you do a supercomputer, right? Right, so parallel computing. So in fact, uh, we were just talking about um, uh, Isambard uh, with uh, University of Bristol and Simon McIntosh Smith. Uh, we just, uh, uh, back in August, we had the 46th international, or was it 47th? Um, uh, hmm. I, mean, I gotta remember what number we're at. I think we had the 47th international conference on parallel processing. So, so it's been going on for, so, for that long? Yeah, it started in 1971. There was a parallel processing computer back Starting then. in 1971, yeah. So in all these 47 years, has, has it been solved yet? Or, I mean, I'm joking, but... Well... Uh, like, it's still a... a, a it's still a huge kind of like challenge, right? Yeah, to it's, to master uh, it. Uh, sure. Um, I mean, it's a uh, the, the, the parallelism that can come at all different levels, and so um, I don't know about mastering it. It's more a matter of um, being able to extract extract the the most parallelism from the lowest level architecture at the instruction level, parallelism level, to thread level parallelism and data level parallelism. Um, uh, to uh, inter internode parallelism, so you've got this hierarchical uh, span of of parallelism that you're trying to get uh, extract out of the codes, and the challenge right now is uh, some of the codes that are not as as inherently parallelizable. Whether or not those codes need to be refactored in a way that are more amenable to parallelization. Or are they just inherently sequential in a way that there's no other way to, to solve it except to, to, to solve that part sequentially and then solve the, whatever you can solve in parallel, solve in parallel. I mean, you're ultimately limited by something called Amdahl's Law. So if half your code is serial and half your code is parallel, the parallel part that you can get to go infinitesimally faster so that it like executes in zero time, so you get a you know, a bazillion fold speed up on the parallel part, that takes that half of the program down to zero, but you're still left with the other half of the program that's serial. So even though you parallelized half of the program to be bazillion times faster, your overall speed up is only a factor of two because you're still stuck with that serial part uh, uh, for half of the program. So there's a lot of optimization work to be done uh, being done or have been done in the last 47 years and yeah, the and, future. Yeah, and, and with all the advent of all the different architectures that are out there now, um, there are certain ways that you have to look at the writing your algorithms for the appropriate parallel computing platform. So some of the work that is being done um, is taking a look at irregular algorithms uh, in the sense that uh, they have irregular execution flow or they have irregular uh, computational granularities, like it, they'll execute, uh, one thread will be very short, uh, another thread will take a very long time to run. Well, those types of irregular codes generally do not do as well on GPUs. So what you have to do, if you're, if you're really good at algorithms and parallelization, 
you might revisit those irregular algorithms, find some way to refactor them to be regular algorithms so that they map well to the GPU. And that would just be one example. Um, so you have to be cognizant of, of um, uh, in parallel computing, you know, there's this the design, this notion of co-design across the hardware to the software to the algorithms, uh, each leveraging each other in a way to, to deliver uh, uh, um, significant speed up. So your 500 list is the most important of them all? Uh, because we want to get to exascale, so we're, right now we're at 16, and we just yeah. need to get a 50? That's not very far, right? How far is yeah, it? That's a factor of three improvement in gigaflops that's, per watt. That's just two, two years. Oh, how, how, how long time does it take to get to, 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 the, to the dream? Well, you know, so if you look at the DARPA exascale computing study, they were targeting 20 megawatt exascale supercomputer, and they were talking about it in, in the year 2015. And uh, we clearly found that it's getting to exaplop or exascale in 2015 wasn't possible. Um, uh, uh, China's uh, looking at uh, making it in 2020, uh, although they've now loosened it, my understanding is uh, from 20 megawatts to 30 megawatts. Um, so they're going to do exaflop in 30 megawatts, uh, which is um, I can't do the math right now off the top of my head, but that's not, you know, it's much lower than 50 gigaflops per watt. Um, uh, the U.S. is, I think, targeting 2021, 20, 2022. So we've bought ourselves uh, uh, five to seven years, depending on how you count, five to seven years of runway in terms of reaching that uh, 20 megawatt uh, thermal envelope. But when you have the exascale, what can you do with it? Is, uh, there, is there a reason people want to have exactly that? Oh, I don't know. It's just it's, like it's a number. A, it's 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 just it's it's another goal uh, to to uh, to be reaching. Um, I mean, before before exaflop, it was petaflop, and before you know that we had it. So, so it's a it's a it's a it's a one thousand fold next improvement. So it, it, if or I should probably say when we reach uh, uh, exascale, um, uh, uh, the next one is uh, zeta scale, I believe. Uh, I think that's right, yeah. So it's Peta, Exa, Zeta, and then Yada. Yada scale. Yeah. I want the Yada scale. You want the Yada scale? It's there 10 years, to, right? Yeah, well, there used to be, there used to, well, you know, okay. with, with the rate at which we've been slowing down in terms of reaching these higher compute speeds, uh, it may be a lot more than 10 years. Okay, but we'll still be around, right? Uh, we'll, uh, uh, so <laughs> we, about, I hope so. <laughs> so how about uh, 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 doing those 500 lists? That means all these supercomputing guys give you access to their hardware, and you can remotely execute your benchmarks, and then you, that's how you do it. Is that how you work? You just sit so, in the office where everything so comes the it's, 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 you have to travel the world constantly with no, the whole staff? No, so, no, so it's, 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 it's a self-reporting uh, um, system. Uh, there's uh, the top 500, and, and, and arguably, uh, by association, the green 500, reserve the right to be able to try and validate uh, the results of, of different uh, systems. Um, but uh, this is a, it's a self-reporting system that, uh, you know, that, that uh, uh, is going on here. And, and, and knowing the community the way it is, it, it, it's going to be pretty obvious that somebody is, is, is uh, stretching the truth a bit uh, in terms of what their performance or what their power consumption is. How many secret supercomputers does the Pentagon have and uh, China and the Russia? Do they have a bunch of secret supercomputers or, or they probably don't? Or you don't have to say? I don't know. I mean, I would know? imagine. Is it possible? They might have like the fastest and uh, keep it secret. Yeah, certainly it's, it's a possible. it's a competitive advantage, right? It's, In this war, you want to uh, be the... Certainly it's possible. I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, what I think is interesting is if you look at the green 500 uh, and the top 500 list is, is that uh, we've been seeing uh, occasional forays into the list by uh, companies like Amazon and Facebook. Um, you know, we, we see Google here uh, with one of their uh, boots. And so uh, most people don't understand that uh, they're using a supercomputer on a daily basis whenever they're doing a search or when they're, when they're, when they're uh, you know, doing social media. There is a there's effectively a supercomputer supercomputer backing these applications when they are getting into our brains and understanding what we want to buy next or something. 
they're using supercomputers. Yeah, oh, well, so yeah, so like Amazon has these recommender systems, and so they've got to run the algorithm someplace to, to, to come up with the recommendation. Now, I don't know uh, how sophisticated, I, mean, I don't work at Amazon, uh, so I cannot speak for them, but you know, uh, depending how sophisticated their recommender algorithm is and what, what different uh, things they take into account, it, it may or may not be the case that they need a, a really big supercomputer, or they might just need you know, four or five, four or five nodes of a, a modest cluster to be able to do the recommendation system. But, um, but the point is, is that in order to do it in a timely manner, they have to do it relatively fast, which means they do need some, some compute, computational power to, to do so. And you're going to have some fun here at the supercomputing event? This is a, like a cool event? Uh, this uh, is the prime event for supercomputing or...? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, this is uh, this is probably one of the main ones. Uh, um, uh, it brings together uh, technical researchers. It brings together uh, vendors, uh, educators, uh, government lab folks. Uh, so it's it brings together a diverse set of people from all around the world uh, to tackle the the uh, challenge of of parallel and distributed computing. I mean this this phone. <laughs> is a parallel computer. It's 15 cores in it, uh, two CPUs, four GPUs, and nine accelerators that, that folks don't really know what, what, what's in it. So, um, And it's, it's, it's still a challenge to get all these apps to use all this power. Yeah, so certainly. Android has had multi-core for so long, but I yeah, don't know how yeah, good yeah. they are multitasking, yeah. multi-using. Well, sometimes it's the apps, the applications themselves, so uh, you could download applications and they only make use of one core. Um, uh, I, I, I teach a class in parallel computation, and the students, when they program their codes, they're, they've been using one core. And so when they start out in my class, I said, all right, well, um, you're going to use your laptops to use the four cores that are in your, on your laptop. You've got a, you've got a, you've got a powerful quad-core CPU. You might as well use it. And they succeed? Um, they all pass the class? Well, yeah. They all uh, yeah, get for the to, most part they they they, they pass the class and they, I think they're they're surpri pleasantly surprised at at uh, how much faster some of the codes that they were running serially are now running in parallel and so um, uh, and and on some of the ones like the the MacBook Pros uh, they have a spare GPU one GPU to drive the graphics display and another GPU for general purpose computation and uh, they're able to accelerate uh, codes uh, uh, you know. Eightfold, tenfold, twelvefold faster than than what they had been doing serially before. Cool. So I'm gonna check out on the internet. Uh, the future of supercomputing in your list is published since this morning, right? The 500 latest. 500. Yes, the latest has been published. Uh, the formal announcements uh, and award sessions will be uh, tomorrow at uh, I believe 5:15 uh, as part of the top 500 uh, birds of a feather session or the boff. Um, and then we will have a, another BOF, the Green 500 BOF, um, which uh, has uh, Natalie Bates, uh, who's part of the Energy Efficiency uh, High Performance Computing Working Group, and Eric Strohmeyer, who's part of the Top 500. Uh, we're, we're, we're running a BOF on the Green 500, and we will talk about the uh, trends that we see on the list. Um, we will also have the number one green supercomputer talk about their uh, energy efficient supercomputer and, and what they did to make it so energy efficient uh, at uh, over 16 gigaflops per watt. Uh, we will also have uh, one or two additional talks on um, uh, what we call level two or level three measurement methodologies. These are higher quality, higher fidelity um, measurement uh, methodologies to really get uh, the power consumption readings of the supercomputers in question uh, more accurately.